an average income. And I think these principles and strategies that I share in the book allow others who are just average Americans uh, facing very difficult economic times, it gives them the ability to put the right uh, processes in place that allow the right use of the money that they do make. And I think that sharing these principles is a, is a great way to allow um, the, the strategies that I've developed over the years to flow through me and flow into others and, and give them the opportunities that, that I've had. Thank you. You begin your book discussing how to budget your income and the importance of prioritizing it. Tell me a little about the priority you've used and how it has increased your ability to build wealth. Yeah, so it's funny because when you, when you say the word budget, people automatically get panicked. If you've never operated on a budget, it's the hardest thing to actually put into place. And a budget for a lot of people is, is like a straitjacket. It's, con it's constrained, you know. And what I say is don't budget your money as much as setting up a priority for how you're going to spend your money. So I, I've created this uh, strategy called the uh, Income Prioritization Strategy. And it's all built around this concept of wants, O-N-C-E. Obligations, necessities, commitments, and everything else. Now your obligations, you, you've got taxes, you have to pay your taxes. It all falls within this parameter of what you have to do. You have to pay taxes. I highly recommend that you have to take care, or you have to take part in company-sponsored benefits. So that's a huge part of the one strategy. And then I suggest an emergency fund 401k falls into that once that obligations. It's an obligation for you to set money aside for future expenses. And so I put those kinds of priorities in the obligations. And then when you move to the necessities, you've got things like food, clothing, shelter, transportation, and utilities. You need those things to have a secure, a comfortable kind of existence. And so you prioritize by taking care of all the obligations, and then you, the next uh, area where you would spend your money is actually on the necessities. And once you have all of that covered, then you have to move to your commitments. Now, unfortunately, commitments in this case means debt. Um, if you stay out of debt, then you have a simple priority of one, obligations, necessities, and everything else. And, and when you pay off your debt, that's where you can get to. And then, of course, everything else being, if you have extra money left over after you've met your priorities, then you can go out and do things. A lot of people flip that, and they want to do everything else first, and then they don't have enough to meet their necessities and their obligations, and that's the problem that we're having and we're seeing in America. So I think that the, the first chapter of the book explains this in great detail, and it allows people to see that you don't have to constrain yourself with a budget. All you have to do is set the right priorities and, and execute on that. In other words, what's most important. Exactly. Got it. Now you mentioned debt is the part of your priority strategy, but then you spend an entire chapter discussing a strategy for eliminating debt. Why such a focus on this one element of your priority strategy? You know, debt is a wealth killer. We're told that you can't build wealth paying somebody else interest. Quite honestly, I think if we can get that priority, if we can engage in and prioritizing that the proper way. Food, clothing, shelter, transportation, and utilities. That's what you need. Now within those categories, you have a level of this is basic and everything else above that is what I was is a preference. And so we have to equate preferences and needs and understand that, you know, we, we need to right that ship when it comes to that. So it's a total mind shift actually, because our culture preaches that you have to have these things. And these things really don't satisfy and push you forward towards setting up goals that you've established in your book. Exactly. Uh, you know, you talk about the mindset of, of society, and that, that really is the, the driver. You have to think differently. That's what behavior modification is all about. Almost every one of us has a behavior that if we modified it in the right direction, we could change our future. That's amazing. So modifying your behavior can certainly have a positive impact on your ability to build wealth. But what happens when the economy tightens 
or a person loses their job or they have a, a substantial um, alteration, for the lack of a better word, in, in their lifestyle that creates a huge dip or at least a small dip in their income? Uh, I've gone through two job layoffs in 30 years. The, the first job layoff I had, I'd worked for the company for 21 years, uh, was laid off, had a severance package, still had a mortgage, and was trying to figure out what we, what we were But because do. we took the severance package, paid off our mortgage, I was able to then take a job for less money as long as I had the health care benefits because health care was number one. And over the course of the seven years that I worked for that job, what ended up happening was through some pay raises and some um, diligent, I actually went back to school to get a different degree. I was actually right back up to where I was when I got laid off. So in seven years, I was able to recoup that, and I didn't. We, we didn't impact our ability to build wealth simply because we made the right decision to take the severance package, and instead of going out and buying new cars, we paid off our house, got rid of our mortgage, and the life drastically changed at that point. So it goes back to choices, because so many people that have had the same experience, they would go out and buy the car, they would take the cruise, they would uh, buy all the toys that certainly won't push them forward to realizing some financial goals. Absolutely, and we're going to talk about goals in a minute, but that's, that's exactly right. The key to building wealth starts with the wisdom on how to apply and distribute the income you currently exactly. make. Positioning and posturing is how you set yourself up to take advantage of economic opportunities. What I mean by that is by paying off all my debt and getting a new job at a company where they actually had an employee stock purchase program. And, and that program allowed me to buy shares of stock at a 15% discount at a rate when I locked it in. It was locked in for two years. At that time, the stock was in the 20s, $20 range. So I asked my wife, I said, can we live on 15% less? Because we were able to commit up to 15% of our income towards this program. And she was like, I don't know if we can live on 15% less. I said, hey, let's just try it for six months and see what happens. After six months, and she loved by the end of that program, we were actually returning 108% on our purchase. And we were able to do that because we had positioned ourselves to be able to live on 15% less of our income. And this is a great opportunity. But if you're not positioned and you haven't postured yourself to be ready to leap on top of any opportunity that comes your way, then what happens is you sit back and you live with regret. You realize that that was an opportunity and because I've decided to commit my income to debt, I can't take advantage of it, whereas somebody else could. These opportunities are floating around us all the time and the idea is you have to position yourself in order to be able to posture to spring onto opportunities when they come. So that's really important to pay attention to what employers offer from time to time and like you said jump on those opportunities which will dramatically change what your future is going to look like because so many of us think about what's happening right now versus how our choices can impact us in 10 years or 30 years down the road. Absolutely and when you change your mindset and you position yourself for opportunity you won't miss too many hours. So I've had a different mindset now. I think of it, hey, you know what? Take advantage of the employee benefits that you have to take, that you need. Mm -hmm. Medical care, dental, vision, a basic life insurance. But you don't have to put money into things that are never really going to benefit you. So learn how to analyze the employee benefits and then pick those that are appropriate for you. I wish somebody would have told me that you know, 30 years ago, I would have had a whole lot more wealth. So your book can literally change the lives of people today and also their families' lives 20 and 30 years down the road, correct? Absolutely, because a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. If you as a parent make the correct decisions today, your grandchildren can benefit from that. So the choices you make impact not only children, grandchildren, it also impacts the amount of money that you're putting out over, let's say, a 30-year loan or paying for a car in a certain way or how you view life from day to day. It literally changes how you think. Exactly. You, you actually become uh, kind of a contrarian. When, when society moves to the right, you look at it and go, hmm, you know, I think there's a different path over here and everybody else is running out and buying new cars. 
I'm going to do something different. I'm going to buy a used car because all I need is a car, right? I don't need a new car. So, you know, when you when you drive a car for a lot, it loses money instantly. Well, why wouldn't I let somebody else take that risk and I just step in behind them and reduce my risk by just buying a good quality used car? I, I just read an article just in the last day or two about some very rich people who buy older cars, or at least normal, in quote, cars. They don't buy the uh, $100,000, $200,000 vehicles. Because in the article it said that they want to make sure that they have money in their family, in their household, in 20 and 30 years when they're not being hired anymore to do movies or they want to retire. So this mindset for most people is, is, is a total shift because most of us are taught based on what we see on TV and other forms that, that you need this now. You, know, you need to go out and buy this brand new this or that now versus preparing for later by telling yourself no. And for some of us, that's really hard to do. Absolutely. If you learn to tell yourself no now, when you get to that later point in life, you'll be able to say yes to so many more things and you won't have the regret of sitting back going, I wish I could, but I can't. All right. So you want to put yourself in a position. That's what that whole chapter, positioning and posturing. You want to make sure that where you are sitting is a position of, of advantage. And it's not wrong to have an advantage, right? Because you've worked hard to put yourself there. While the rest of the world is making the decisions based upon what everybody else is doing, you know, I, I've got the, uh, the the older iPhone. I've got a, a, an older computer. I mean, I, I keep my computers for ten years. Well, you know, most people don't do that. Um, my computer literally has to die before I'll buy a new computer right. because I don't want to put the money out. But I can take that that same amount of money and invest it in over that course of that ten years that, that computer lasts. I've got plenty more wealth. Mm -hmm. And then I can go out and buy a computer and, and write a check and not even think about having to do it on payments. So if you would say that how many people in a hundred actually follow these guidelines, my guess would be less than five out of a hundred people have mastered these secrets that can literally change their lives. So people who purchase this book and master the information in it can literally literally be in the top 5% of Americans that are living a life that 95% don't even understand. Yeah, and that's an interesting thing because when you, when you throw away around a percentage of 5% or 1%, you know, the top 1%, mm -hmm. most of the time they're measuring that by income earners, right. right? But income is a really bad measurement of wealth. Wealth is measured by accumulation. So you can have an average income and still accumulate vast amounts of wealth because you're making the right decisions. And so I would say yes, if, if, if the person takes this book, masters what's in it, and applies it, and thinks, hey, how does this particular decision or action or opportunity move me towards achieving what I want to achieve? If they ask that question, and the answer is it doesn't really move me in that direction, it kind, of, it kind of slows down my progress, then I think what they have to do is say no. And it's so hard to say a little two-letter word. No, you can't have that right now. But you know what? Give yourself 15 years, and you're going to be able to have much more than you ever anticipated. Somebody said, I can't remember who said it, but they said, if you tell yourself no now, you'll be able to say a lot more yeses down the road. Absolutely. And this book really, really magnifies on that point in so many different ways. You talk about a model for, for setting goals that allows the reader to achieve the success that he or she really wants, but you also present some things to avoid when setting goals. So if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, so real quick, the goal model is simple. You need to do a present state analysis. You're setting a financial goal. So the present state analysis is what are my finances, what are my incomes, what are my outflows? You kind of look at how many, uh, how many uh, uh, claims you have you know, on your taxes, you claim five or six or state and federal, all of these things play into a financial picture. And then you want to say, where do, what do I want to look like? What is my future state? What do I want that to look like? And in, in the, between those two is what I call the gap analysis. Here is where I am, here is where I want to go, and what's missing I have to achieve. So the gap analysis identifies what it's going to take to get to where you want to go. And then for each one of those things that is missing, you have to set an objective to achieve it. How am I going to achieve 
getting what I'm missing in order to get to where I want to go. And it's all drawn out in the book, very, very detailed. But I think the key with, with goal setting is we have to think of positive goals. This, I think, is the key. So many people say, I want to stop smoking. Well, the problem is, is when you try to, you set a negative goal, you want to take something away from your life. I want to stop smoking. It causes you to focus on what you're missing. So the idea is don't set a negative goal. I want to stop smoking. I want to lose weight. Set a positive goal. Set a goal that adds something to your life. Um, you know, instead of losing weight, I want to have healthier behaviors. Um, I'm going to go learn a new sport. I'm going to go take uh, hop keto. Uh, that's what I did this past year. I signed up uh, to, to take hop keto. Um, it's, I've been out of it for 27 years, and I was like, you know what? I need to get back to that mindset of adding something to my life. And that's a real critical point. When you start adding things to your life that are positive and move you in a direction, then you're going to start achieving more. And the key is with a goal, when you get to your new present state, like you got, I got my present state, I got my desired future state. You've bridged the gap, you've set your objective, you've got your time frame, and you nail it. That desired future state now becomes your new present state. And now you say, where do I want to go from here? So it's a confidence building thing. If you set a goal that's not achievable, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say, well, I want to be a millionaire and I want to do it by next year. Probably not going to happen. So you're setting yourself up for failure. So you don't want to set goals that are going to set you up for failure. You want to set achievable goals, realistic, relevant. They have to be relevant to what your lifestyle is. You know, not everybody's going to be a, uh, a well-known actor or actress. Not everybody's going to be uh, a president. Not everybody's going to be a, a sports hero, right? So relevant to what your life is. That means that you actually have to do an inventory of who you are as a person. And I don't go into it in the book, but there are other books that I've written where I go into it about the dynamics of who you are, your temperament. These are things that contribute to it. Uh, once you figure out who you are as a person, then from there on out, you know, you can achieve any goal that's relevant and achievable. And those are really key points. Thank you, Ken. Yes. Um, I would just like to say, if you want to stop by my website, it's www.kenrupert.com. And on there, you can go to the book page, and you can find simple wealth building strategies along with a couple of other books that I've written that I think will add value to your life. If you're out there and you want to read a really good book and, and, and start to change the dynamics of where you're going, this is the book for you to do it in.